Okay, hi. Um, so today we're kind of heading into the uh, end of our course here. We're at the final, the final section five on um, uh, uh, scheduling with, um, uh, so CPU scheduling is our topic for these last three weeks here. Um, so, you know, as usual, I, I, I was going to maybe talk a little bit about the programming assignment uh, here today and, and while I'm waiting to see if anybody um, shows up and has any questions or anything. Uh, kind of announcement here, uh, and I'll, I'll post uh, this as well for our class website, but um, if you're watching this video after the fact, so as you may or may not know, we've got actually just um, um, one more week. So, so we've got this week of, of classes, one more week after this of classes, and then the week after that is actually finals week. So we don't have, have classes, we just have a final schedule during that final week. Um, if you weren't aware, we don't actually have a comprehensive final exam for this class. So I just do the five tests and the five programming assignments um, and the five written problem sets. So that's all of your evaluation for this course. So I usually do in this course on the last week of classes um, and, and you don't actually have any uh, specific thing to do during finals week uh, unless you wanna meet with me as kind of as a, as a final wrap up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this um, semester, because of the week we got things pushed back and, there, and everything that was happening, um, we ended up with our uh, last week of this fifth unit um, being scheduled during finals week. Um, but I would encourage you to, you know, if, if you want to, if it'll help you out to maybe try and get um, all of your uh, work and materials done for this course by the end of next week. Okay, I mean you don't have to. I'll leave. I'll leave the. Um, uh, I'll leave the deadlines for the last program assignment for the Wednesday during finals week, and for the last test for the the last Friday during finals week. Um, but you know, if if you need to concentrate on other classes, you know, I mean, as usual, you could always just uh, do the uh, program assignment and, and turn it in um, before it's due on Wednesday. Uh, likewise, I'm I'm going to open up the the final test five, not not the final, the the, the last test five. Um, I'm going to open that up actually on the Friday, the week before. I'll leave it open for a full week. But again, for that, if it'll help you out to uh, take that early so you can concentrate on some other things during finals week, um, you know, maybe you can plan on doing that. So like I said, I'll, I'll post an announcement about those as well, but um, that, that would be something that um, I would encourage you to do if that'll help you out, you know, trying to get your stuff wrapped up by the end of next week for this course. So, um, all right. So I, I wanted to, to uh, and, and with that in mind, I'm gonna talk, today about programming assignment five um, to maybe encourage you to get started on that um, a little bit sooner than you might have might usually be doing. Um, and I'll probably talk about it maybe next Monday as well. Um, and, and of course, I welcome if anybody has questions to email me or, you know, to jump onto these help sessions if, if you need to ask about things. So um, the, the, the last assignment is a simulation about process scheduling, which is our topic for our fifth unit for this class here. Um, the, 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 the um, design of the simulation is pretty similar to the one that we had last week for um, doing uh, uh, paging, um, the, the, the paging simulator, right? Where we were um, implementing um, a clock paging, um, algorithm and and we and, and I'd given you a first in first out um, paging algorithm okay so th they're similar in that for the process scheduler we, we've got a similar layout uh, we're using I was trying to remember it last week I'd forgotten but we're using what's known as a um, as a strategy design pattern okay so if you've ever if you've never run across what are called design patterns especially object oriented design patterns, I'd encourage you to Google that. So that's that's a good thing to have kind of heard about um, as an undergraduate computer scientist. Um, so the strategy pattern, we actually used that last week for our paging strategies, and we're using it again for the um, scheduling policy strategies. So, so the, in a nutshell, the design pattern is 
Um, you use object-oriented inheritance, and you have like a base class. So our base class this week is base is is a scheduling policy, and then um, you create concrete. So this scheduling policy base class will be a virtual, what's known as a virtual class, um, an, an abstract base class. Um, and you create concrete implementations of a scheduling policy. So like first come first serve um, or round robin scheduler or um, um, some of the other choices, um, short process next, short remaining time, the, the types of schedulers that you're gonna be uh, learning about when you do your readings this week and when you watch um, my videos this week about process scheduling. So, um, but yeah, the reason one, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this program assignment than maybe I did last week is that I, I leave this one a little bit more open ended. Okay. So I pretty much required you for the last unit to implement one of the strategies, the clock paging strategy, okay? This week, I don't give you really any framework, okay? So you actually have to, I mean, I do have one example scheduling policy implemented, first come, first served, but you have to basically implement um, one of the, the uh, a different strategy. You know, you can select what you want. Um, I would encourage you maybe to use uh, round robin should be relatively easy. So we've done a lot of examples of doing some round robin sorts of uh, queuing um, and scheduling in this class at, at different points for different purposes. So, uh, but, you, but you could choose whichever one you want, shortest process next or shortest remaining time, for example, or whatever. Um, but this is more open-ended. Um, so you will, yeah, there won't be like a, uh, a round robin scheduling policy out there. You'll have to actually, you, you'll want to do this by copying the first come for serve scheduling policy, renaming it to like round robin, but then you'll have to go in and understand it to implement the particular um, scheduling policy that you um, chose, okay? So I'll, I'll show that, although I might show that in more detail next Monday, but let, let's, let's get started as usual on, on this um, assignment. I had some, some warm up kinds of tasks. So your first unit test tasks, um, again, is some getter methods. So implementing those. So, so, so let's do those. And then maybe once I've done those, um, maybe I'll jump today and talk about um, kind of this last step, what you'd have to do to do these things, okay? To, to uh, do another scheduling policy, uh, add it to the system here. All right. Um, so let me open Visual Studio here. So as usual, I got my stuff from the previous week's assignment open up here and get that stuff closed off. I wonder if there's, there's probably something to like close all windows here instead of closing them one by one. I should, I should sit down and learn. Um, um, some of the more advanced uh, keyboard shortcuts and, and features and windows. I'm sure it has it probably like um, view close all or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to search for it here. So get these all closed off. So as usual, for all these simulators um, for assignment five, the initial code I gave you should always be in a compilable and runnable state. So the first thing you should always do is like bring up assignment five tests um, and try and maybe do a, a initially maybe make sure everything is clean before you do your first build or I should normally do that because I often leave stuff around here that I've um, you know uh, from building and testing things out um, and then uh, do a build and make all make certain that every that everything builds and then run right so and it should run but of course, um, it'll run, but not be passing many or um, any of your uh, unit tests for the assignment, right? But as I always encourage you to do, you know, I mean, make certain that you keep your program in a compilable state, and then it's always compilable and running the unit tests, right? So, so you know, that that really should be a a basic fundamental thing that you know how to do at the end of 
a degree in like computer science, uh, just as learning how to program, right? So, so you should always be able to, to, to have your program in a state so that you can actually run it and test it and, 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 and do your tests and, and, and then make progress by adding on things incrementally. Um, to your tests here. So, uh, okay, so I'll, as usual, I'll take a little bit of time to compile the tests. Let me go ahead and get the, um, your, your first things that you do um, are in um, the, uh, just the, 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 the scheduling policy, um, or sorry, in the scheduling system. So the scheduling policy is an abstract base class. I'll look at that maybe in a little bit, but the scheduling system, I had a few tasks that you had to do in there first. So let's get the scheduling system open up while we're waiting for this to compile here. So we'll open up the uh, implementation file, the .cpp file, and the header file, the .cpp file. Uh, let me go ahead and put this over here. It's a little bit smaller, maybe. Um, all right, so as usual, the first things you have to implement are, um, uh, so um, maybe I'll talk in general a little bit though, first about the scheduling policy and about the simulation files. Um, so um, this has some similar similarity to the uh, to our unit two because again we are simulating um, running processes and then scheduling them. Okay, so the round robin process um, scheduler that we did for our simulation two, you know, uh, has a bit of overlap here. Um, but um, oh, I'm right. I guess I do have some stubs for the shortest process next um, and first come first serve. Okay, so um, so yeah, you might just have to um, um, actually implement these um, processes here. So um, so um, as I said, okay. So yeah, I finally finished building. So let's let's just see if the unit test run then. Control Shift T to run our test. Um, so, oh, um, oh, gee, I must have, um, I must have the the solution code on here. So let, let me pause and and um, uh, get this back to a clean uh, uh, slate here. So just a second. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, yeah, I said a few incorrect things because I I actually had. Um, the, uh, the the code that had been worked on there. So when you compile it, uh, it should compile, but uh, yeah, when you run, I mean, as usual, um, uh, not all the tests will be passing, right? So, um, and in fact, it should be failing like the very first um, test here because those are the, the, the getter methods. So the very first one that'll, that'll fail will be the one on line 41. Um, Get number of processes. Yeah, some of these might be uh, working for you, but um, but yeah, the first one you're supposed to implement was that get number of processes. Um, get system time, get number of processes, and is CPU idle. So, so yeah, some of those anyway, you'll have to implement as the first thing. So, um, all right. Oh, and, and um, yeah, and, and also, um, I was right in my initial thinking. So you won't have anything in here except for the first come first serve scheduling policy um, and the abstract base class, the scheduling policy base class. Okay, so I'll come back and talk about those here. So, um, so your first things you'll have to do is, is, is add a couple of, of those getter methods into the scheduling system as kind of a warm up task, um, like I talk about. So the scheduling system is, is really just um, kind of like the um, operating system. So it's the thing that's managing the processes. So again, like, like um, the simulation we did all the way back in the second unit for this class. So it's got things, similar things that you had to implement on that first one. Um, Like, um, so if, if we look at, I mean, you know, it's got a process class, so it manages a set of processes like we did uh, back on that with you. And the scheduling system keeps track of the number of processes um, 
um, and a process table um, and um, the current process that's running on the CPU, okay, and so on, right? So, but you're not gonna have to implement these things this, this time. So, but these will be pretty similar to the implementation, example implementation that I showed you um, on the first one. The, the difference being though, that um, in this case, uh, we're not gonna just pick the, the, the process that's been waiting the longest that's at the front of the, um, uh, the, the ready queue. I mean, we could, that's, that's the round robin scheduler. Okay, so if you implement the round robin scheduler, you should end up with a simulation that will work pretty much in the same way um, as the, 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 the basic round robin scheduling that we did uh, from the second week. Okay, but the, the thing is, we can, we can plug in other policies, scheduling policies here using that, um, um, using that design pattern, that, that policy design pattern that I talked about here. So, um, So yeah, and, and um, you know, you won't have to be, I don't think you have, have a lot that you have to do for the scheduling system, except for some of these warm up tasks. Well, that, that's not true. So you will have to, uh, besides implementing a couple of the getters, you will have to um, uh, implement some of these others that are a little bit more than getters, like uh, determine if um, um, all processes are done, um, and implement a few things on the, like check processing, process arrivals correctly and, and simulate, uh, oh, that, the simulate CPU cycles has been given to you, but, uh, but you want to check if the processes are finished. Uh, so a couple things, um, in, in the, the, the basic one that's actually managing, you know, the, the processes and managing simulating processes coming into the system and, and being run and, and being scheduled and then, so. Um, let me look at, while I'm thinking about it, let's just look at the basic um, layout of, so here, the input looks the same as like the input from the chapter nine and 10 uh, examples where we simulate doing process scheduling by hand. So what you get is a table of processes with a name. So, so the first line is just the number of processes that are going to enter the, the, the system simulation here. And I think this first one is the, um, the set of processes and their arrival times and the, the total time for the process for the example that was used in uh, chapter nine of our textbook, right? So this should be the same set of processes. So, so here process A arrives at time three and it uh, needs three time units in total to finish its task, right? So that's, that's the total. So this is the arrival time and the total time. And you know, process B arrives at time two, C at time four and so on. And process D is the longest process. It, it needs five time units to complete its task, so, right? So the input for the simulations was relatively simple. Um, these .sim files, um, so as usual, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of get you started with the very first one. So let's look at uh, maybe not all these, but um, um, our um, getter methods that you're supposed to implement is the get system time, the get number of processes, is CPU idle, and the get running process name, okay? So you can implement most of these by just returning the corresponding uh, member variable, which hopefully you're pretty familiar with by now what we mean by that. So, so all these ones that are get should have already a member variable. Um, yeah, so there's a system time um, member variable, not in the process, but in the scheduling system. So there's a um, system time member variable. Um, there's a number of processes member variable. Um, uh, running process name um, is a little bit so. So the running process um, should be um, um, the should be indicated by having the the uh, PID set. Okay. So uh, to get the name, you're going to have to use the PID to get into the process table. Um, 
and uh, and I'll show that. So let, let's let, let's do the, the the simple ones real quickly. Then the get number of processes um, and um, the get system time, right? So um, as I already showed, um, um, it was passing um, these here. So so the first failing test um, that you should find. Um, is the one down here in 41, but it's passing these probably because I've stubbed these out for you. So yeah, if we look at the get system time, um, so it, it, it passes this one, but um, after we load um, like a, a simulation, the number of processes should be five and not zero, right? So, um, so that, that'd be the first one that we can easily uh, 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 get correct here, right? Get, get number of processes. Um, so yeah, get system time is just returning zero, you know, but so that should just, you know, return the, um, uh, the, the system time, right? So um, um, that starts off at zero, but um, uh, we don't test that for a while here, but um, down here in the second set of unit tests, um, Um, you know, we might not test get system time all the way till down here uh, when we simulate um, doing some dispatching and um, simulate some of the CPU cycles. Okay, so um, but um, Uh, the get number of processes. Let's look at that one, right? So, to do this one, you, you do have to understand uh, kind of the the layout of the stuff that I've given you here. So, um, for our scheduling system, you will notice that we are using a process pointer for our process table, okay? So we basically just use um, a, a regular array of processes, okay? So somewhere in here, so, so initially we set processes to null, right? So, so um, this, this array isn't created until we load some processes, okay? Um, So um, oh, in this case, though, I mean, we're supposed to be setting the number of processes when this was loaded correctly. So again, um, you know, we, we've got a separate member variable number of processes um, that's supposed to be being initialized in the um, constructor for the class, um, which um, I'm just noticing it might not be initialized correctly. So, so maybe we need to add in something in there to initialize number of processes to zero um, um, uh, here, or else things might not quite work the way that, that we're thinking. Right. So yeah, I do wonder, um, since we were returning, oh, well, um, yeah, so the get number of processes was just returning uh, zero. Um, so, so of course, um, the safe to always return zero, but um, if we want to return the memory variable, we have to make certain that it's correctly initialized. All right. So now this is initialized to zero, um, and, and the system time we saw was initialized to zero as well here. So um, oh, um, maybe the way I've got things set up, we're calling reset system. So instead of initializing this here, we should probably make certain that um, that every time reset system is, is called, that we correctly um, that we correctly um, 
make certain that the number of proxies go back to zero, you know, and, and that all, all the other things, system time goes back to zero and CPU is idle. So this is probably the, 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 the correct place to be initializing number of proxies like system time and so on, okay? So before I go too far, again, you know, thinking about incremental programming, um, let, let, let's just test those and make certain that I didn't break anything. So we should still be passing kind of these first two, um, the, 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 these first ones here. Um, um, but, but we won't be passing this yet unless we are correctly initializing the number of processes when we load the process table, which we might be doing here, which I might be doing for you if we look into the load process table here. Um, but yeah, I only change things in here. So hopefully if I do a rebuild, it will only have to rebuild the scheduling system and it should link, should build and then link relatively quickly and then we can run our tests. So we ran our tests. We can look again. So we're still the first one. We're still failing is forty one. But yeah, we still are passing these, even though you know I, I changed get system time to be returning the, the, the variable here. Um, and we're still failing this because get number of processes is does still seem to be returning zero here. So let, let's check that one out, okay? Because we are returning the number of processes. Um, so when we load the process table, we're expecting that. To um, um, have five processes if we're if we're loading the, the simulation one, the process table one simulation here, right? So um, let's look at that load process table. So you shouldn't shouldn't have to change this. So um, So here, if you look through the function, basically, if we already have an existing one, we get rid of it, um, and then we, we create. So, so you know, we've read in the number of processes. That that's that first line. I guess I closed off the, the dot sim file, but the first line um, is actually the number of processes. So we use that to allocate um, an array of exactly the number of processes that we need to manage in the simulation. So, you know, and that, so we're not using anything more fancy like a, a standard template library list or something, although we could have used like a vector maybe or something here, but we just use a regular array of processes. Um, and um, yeah, that this should have set number of processes to be, um, because this is actually reading it into the, um, um, into the member variable number of processes here, right? So, so we set it and then we use a loop then to read that number of processes um, from the, um, um, the, the file. Uh, oh, I did, yeah, so I do call reset system here. So I actually don't want to set the number of prior. That, that's why it's failing here. Um, so, so I gave you the, the wrong advice here. So since we call reset system, um, but we're setting the number of processes in the load process uh, table uh, function here, uh, we don't really want to. We want to leave it to that function to be setting the number of processes correctly. So, um, so yeah, I was wrong. But it would be safer, um, and I probably should have had this in the code that I gave you originally, to, to make certain that it is initialized at least, even if, even if we haven't called load, uh, because we're calling some of these functions before we're calling the load process table. So I probably really should have been initializing that as well in the constructor, like right there, right? So now what I'm expecting, um, um, since I didn't, set that back to zero now in the reset after we load the, the process table i should be passing this one hopefully um, because uh, the load process table is supposed to be setting that to five and we're returning 
the number of processes now in um, our constructor uh, in the get number of processes. So it should be passing um, uh, that one on line 41 here. And indeed it is, right? So um, you know, I don't know if, if the rest of these, like is CPU idle working in the Git ring process name? Let's look at, the, at those real quickly. But, but yeah, notice we are passing Git number processes, um, but um, we're, not pro we're not passing the all processes done, but that's, that's your, one of your task two ones. Uh, that, that's your task two uh, task that you're supposed to be doing. I won't show you that one. So. But let's go back to these others. So like um, like the get running process name and is the CPU idle. Um, um, so you do have to check those as well. You get, make sure those are implemented. Th those won't be straightforward getters like um, the get system time and the get number of processes here. So, um, So again, we're all, we're just hard coding um, um, like, like the get running process name is idle here. So um, that won't pass later on once we actually um, um, once we actually try and dispatch a process and, and try and simulate um, some CPU cycles here. So so that will have to be changed. Um, And um, is the, the, the is CPU idle? I want to look at that one as well, real quickly here. So again, we're only returning true here. Now this one should be relatively easy because um, basically we're going to be using the the, the CPU member variable, um, and this will be set to idle um, when the CPU is idle. But it'll be set to um, so again we've got. Um, well, not again, but uh, like the example solution that I showed you from, from the unit two, we've got a, a, we use minus one as a flag to represent an idle CPU, and then, a, then zero, so PID of zero, one, two um, are all valid process identifiers um, in this simulation. So if it's not negative one, then something is running, and if it is negative one or if it is idle, then, then the CPU um, is currently idle. So those are what you have to check here, right? Uh, but um, but yeah, admittedly for this first task, um, um, I, 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 should, I should probably work on my my assignment here because you don't really get a chance to test those very well because yeah, it's going to be passing these with the stubs. Um, but uh, you could actually move on to task two, getting all processes done. Um, before you get, before you have to, to actually get those working uh, correctly or not, right? So the very first time where you'd have to check those would be after you have um, gotten the disk dispatch CPU if idle. So I don't remember if I made you implement that one or not. Um, I mean, you, in order to get the dispatch CPU if idle working, um, uh, you have to use check process arrivals in dispatch CPU if idle. Um, oh, but yeah, so you have to write that one, right? So you will have to get the dispatch CPU of idle working, and then after you dispatch a process, that will be when you'll be able to actually check whether your is CPU idle working or not. Okay. But just as a hint for both this one and this other one, so so for this one, basically the um, um, the CPU member variable. 
process, but in, in the scheduling system, the CPU member variable, you know, so it's going to be idle. So, so you want to return true if, if the CPU is idle, is equal to, is equal to um, this flag idle. Right, so that, and, and if it's not equal to that flag, um, so if it's not idle, then you want to return um, false, right? Because in that case, there is a process running. Uh, likewise, for the get running process, um, although here, you know, you'll, you'll want to, to reuse the is idle. So if, if the process is idle, you just want to return the string idle. If it's not, though, you have to, look up the process in the process table. So if it's not, you'll, you'll have the, the, the CPU is actually the index um, in the process table. So, so, so when, when the CPU is not idle, this will be like 0, 1, 2, 3. And that's actually the index into your process table. And then the, 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 the items in the process table are actually pointers uh, to process items, right? So, so basically, you can use that as an index, um, and then you can access the name of the process, and that's what you want to return if your CPU is not idle. All right. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to show those right now. Um, although I'll be happy to maybe later on if people struggle with those. But, but. Um, but yeah, admittedly, with this assignment, you don't have to, I mean, you could kind of skip over those, leave those stubbed out, and work on your all processes done and your dispatch CPU of idle. Uh, and then it'll make a little bit more sense. Once you have, once you have those two working, um, you'll see what, you should be able to see what you need to do for the, the, the get running process name and the CPU idle um, a bit more. So, all right. Okay, one final thing before I wrap up here. Um, I did want to give you then a heads up. So like I said, it's open-ended. Um, and the only thing that I give you is the first come first serve scheduling policy. So this time you won't have to make any changes to this. This is just an example of a, um, of a implementation of a scheduling policy for this, uh, for the object oriented um, design pattern here where, where we're using um, uh, where we're using a strat these defined strategies okay so first come first serve is a um, it's it's a concrete implementation of the scheduling policy the, this general abstract base class scheduling policy so um, we'll look at that real quickly. So this defines the interface and then everything um, that wants to be a concrete scheduling policy, like first come first serve or round robin or whatever, has to inherit from this. And you have to implement the, these things with the equal zero. These are known as virtual um, functions, okay? So, so all concrete, imp concrete implementations of a scheduling policy have to implement the new process function, the dispatch function, the preempt, and the reset policy. Okay. Um, and I can look at those. Um, so as you'll you'll see in here, so um, in the first come first serve, we actually implement all those, and, and also a constructor and a destructor. Right. Um, So the policies are a little bit more um, complicated than they were in week four, where we were doing paging policies. So here for the scheduling policies, you actually have four things you have to do for each policy, um, as well as you probably also might have to do some different things in the constructor and the destructor. Okay? So for our first come first serve, we don't really have to do much. We just call reset um, policy here. Um, that is implemented in the base class, right? So if you look in the scheduling, um, if you look in the scheduling policy, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, the reset policy is also an, an abstract item. So, so um, 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 you have to implement that for all of the uh, policy, for, for the policy that you implement, you know, in, in this um, assignment here. Um, 
So let, let's look at these one by one. So for first come, first serve, um, First come, first serve, and round robin. Um, if you, when you watch the or read the materials for this class or watch the videos for this part of the class, so, so these both use a queue. Okay, the the difference between round robin and first come, first serve is that the round robin has the preemptive, right? So you, so you only schedule uh, for a, a time slice quantum, and then if it exceeds the time slice quantum, you have to return it back. To the queue, but first come for serve is simpler than round robin. So you just keep a, a queue of arrivals, um, and we show that uh, in this implementation by using a ready queue, um, which is just a, a, a queue, a, a standard template library queue of process identifiers here. Right? So basically, you know, the, 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 the scheduling system, every time a new process arrives, it's going to call the scheduling policy to inform it that a new process arrives. So whatever the scheduling policy is, you have to, to keep track. Of, if you need to keep track of like the, when the order that processes arrive, you have to do something in new process, right? So for the first come first serve scheduling policy, you have to keep a queue of the processes so that you know which one arrived first, second, and third. Um, and so on, or you could have done this. I could have done this some other way, um, but um, but but I just use a queue for this example, and and we just push it onto the end of our ready queue. Right? And then for dispatch, so any time um, the the CPU becomes idle uh, in the scheduling system, it's going to call dispatch. Okay, so and then it's up to the scheduling policy just to decide which process to dispatch. And, and what you need to return is the identifier, the, the process identifier, the ID of the process to, um, that should be the next one to run. That's what the dispatch does, right? according to the, the, the policy that you're implementing here. So, so here, basically, if the ready queue is, is empty, we're supposed to, we need to return idle for the first come, first serve. Many, many of your, um, um, whatever scheduling policy you decide to implement, you do have to maybe handle the fact that you don't have any process that's ready to run, in which case you need to return idle um, if, if dispatch is called. Otherwise, for our first come first serve, we just take the, the item off the front of the ready queue. Um, so we, we take it off by, by getting the front item and then popping it off. We need to remove it from our ready queue and then we return that item. That's, that's the item to dispatch using a first come first serve policy right? um, and first come first serve uh, again once you read through the materials or watch the uh, videos for this week is a non-preemptive policy scheduler okay so we don't have anything to do for um, preemption right so what preempt is supposed to do, if you, if you write a scheduler, a scheduling policy that um, supports preemption, basically the, um, the um, scheduling system is going to be calling the scheduling policy like every CPU cycle to ask whether I should preempt or not, right? And the, the, the scheduling policy has to make that decision, okay, do I preempt or not preempt, right? Um, so for, for non-preemptive policies, you just always return false. But for preemptive policies, you have to correctly return uh, true if, if, you're, if you need to be preempting the system. So for the round robin scheduler, you'd have to be keeping track of the uh, number of time slice quantums that the process is run. And if it's exceeded its time slice quantum, then you'd need to return true to allow the current running process to be preempted. Um, and then reset policy um, should just be in case we do restart a, a new simulation that you need to reset your scheduling policy back to, you know, an initial state. So for first come, first serve, that means that we need to, to, to make, a, a, we need to make our ready queue empty again, right? So I do that slightly trick, in a slightly tricky way here. I just, uh, I create a new empty queue um, and I swap the, the current ready queue with this empty one. So, all 
I mean, so that was real quickly kind of what the first come first serve scheduler does. So when you, uh, so the last thing I'll do for just the last two or three minutes here of this help session, when you want to implement, when you get to the part where you're supposed to be implementing your own scheduling policy, let's say you decide to do um, round robin, okay? So what you'll want to do, um, is for example, maybe copy first come first serve. Um, so I can say copy that, that HPP file. Um, and I think I can just say, paste, control V to paste it back in there to get a copy of it. Um, and then we'll rename it to um, um, Rob. Um, and I'll need both that and I'll need the implementation file. So I get the best CPP file, copy, control C, and then control V to paste it. Um, and then I'll rename as Ram Robin scheduling policy dot CPP, right? Um, and then the second step you'll want to do so the, the minimum thing in order to make certain everything compiles and runs, um, you can't leave the name as first come, first serve, right? Um, changes to just a single window here. So I want to do kind of basically a global search and replace to, re to replace first come first serve scheduling policy with round robin scheduling policy, okay? So um, Alt Shift F allows you to do uh, like a find and replace in Visual Studio code. So I might want to Search and replace first come for serve and replace that with oops, um, mess that out. Let's try it again. So, um, Uh, oh, there it is. So um, first come, first serve scheduling. Oh, yeah, you have to be aware. So there, there's one version of this that will change it in all files in your project, which you have to be careful with because uh, I don't want to change it in the actual first come, first serve. I don't want to change it in the scheduling policy. So um, I don't really want to do it here. Um, So yeah, I just want to replace it in the current file instead of replacing it in all files here. So uh, yeah, replace the first come for serve scheduling policy with the round robin scheduling policy, right? I spelled that so. First come, first serve as scheduling scheduling policy. There we go. So um, so here's the buttons. Or you can use Control Enter to replace or replace all to so replace that. So besides this, though, you know you do also have to uh, change. You, you want to change these as well, or else you'll have problems. So you don't want to have these these if not def uh, map um, uh, header um, um, protection uh, macros have the same name as in the other file as well. Um, you should you should you know make an effort to also change like the documentation. I won't do that right now um, to to match what you're doing. So we changed all those in the header file. Um, I, I, I should change these as well. I could do a search and replace again, but uh, change these. I'm Robin, but don't and don't forget um, um, the end if oh well um, yeah, it's commented out, but um, 
always good to make certain your comments match your code. So try not to forget those. So we save that. Um, and I, sh I, sh I should do a search and replace. There'll be a lot more to search and replace um, on the implementation file because all of the member functions uh, will be identified as being member functions of this. Um, but um, let's do the find and replace again. Uh, oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of Visual Studio is nice, kind of remembers these. So let's go ahead and replace. I could probably do a replace all here, but I'm gonna kind of watch going through all these. And again, I should I should go back and change my documentation to match now. Um, but yeah, all these replacements look correct. And there we go. All right. And I'll leave, I mean, I'll leave all the code in here. So even though it's a Ron Robbins scheduler, um, um, it would work, it'll be implementing first come, first serve instead of Ron Robin, right? So kind of as a big hint, I mean, for Ron Robin, I mean, one of the biggest things is you have to keep track of um, a time slice quantum and um, you'll have to correctly be doing preemption and returning it back to the end of your uh, ready queue um, um, whenever preemption happens. So. Uh, but the other thing, uh, so, so this isn't part of the build system, so this is something that you haven't had to do so far in this class yet. Um, so if, if you build this, um, um, nothing will be done because you would technically have to add this to your build system as well. To do that, you will have to edit the make file, which you haven't had to do so far yet in this class. So the correct way to do that is there's a set of sources that get built. Um, and I think all you have to do is just add this, your scheduling policy, um, and be careful of these backslashes for the in the lines here. So if I add these, I need a backslash on this line. You don't need one on the last line. Um, but these are the new file that I called from Robin scheduling policy HPP and non Robin scheduling policy CPP. Um, uh, actually, uh, there is one more thing at the bottom. You would find um, there's a, an additional prerequisite specified for first come first serve. Um, your round robin should have the same prerequisites except for the .o file would depend on the .cpp file for round robin. Um, um, well, that should have been .hpp and .cpp file. So that I've got a mistake in my make file here. Um, I'll try and fix that and do a push. Um, but yeah, so the scheduling policy should have uh, depended on the .cpp and the .hpp file, and as well as scheduling system. Um, first come, first serve should, should depend on the .cpp and the .hpp and the scheduling policy header file. And if you create a new one, Ron Robin scheduling policy should depend on Round robin .cpp and the round robin .hpp file, as well as the scheduling policy. Because um, you know, to rebuild this object file, you need to rebuild the source file. But um, you know, this this these classes um, inherit from the scheduling policy base class. So if anything changes in the .hpp header file, there you need to rebuild these as well. So that's kind of what this is saying here. Right. Let me check here. I think. Uh, I think I got that right. Um, so once you do that, now if I do a, a rebuild, um, it should, it didn't. So it, it should rebuild um, the, the re, our round robin scheduling policy um, if, if we have the make file correct. Um, oh, yeah, there's one more thing. So um, um, I have to add it as well to the um, dot .o object files that are part of the project here. Um, Once I do that, it probably should build. So let's try. Uh, 
right? You don't need to backslash. You know, the, the last line doesn't need to backslash in this make file. But, um, uh, so this will tell uh, uh, that I need to have a dot O, and in order to create that dot O, it knows how to do that um, from the spe specification of, of things, hopefully. So let's try building again here. There we go. So what you want to look for is that it actually builds uh, .o from the .cpp file, and then um, it actually links it in to um, the uh, .sim and the .test here. So you, so you see that round robin scheduling policy .o is linked in with all the rest of the things to create the .test and that that .sim. Okay. And there's a few other additional things, but but that's the minimal. Once you get that far, now any changes you make to Ron Robin scheduling policy will actually get compiled in, um, and you'll be able to test them in the, the, the simulator, the, the, the test executed. Um, okay, so I think that was all I wanted to cover today. I'll probably recover uh, some of this, a lot of this next Monday again as well. Um, like I like I said, like I encourage you to get started on the program assignment uh, early if you can. You know, so it might be helpful for people to try and get things wrapped up um, next week for this class. So I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Um, all right. And yes, yeah, so that's it for this video. As usual, send me questions by email if you have them or join me um, at our next help session. Um, and I will see you then.